going to drop this down. It's okay. Sorry, you don't have to bring it back up when it's time. So, a couple weeks ago when we started looking at Romans chapter 9, I told you that the passage that we are studying now is easy to understand, but hard to accept. So we spent a fair amount of time, two weeks in fact, covering verses 6 to 13, just helping us to understand exactly what God is saying there and what it means for us. As we continue to study through this, um, I want to make a couple things very clear. First of all, what this passage says, and the idea that we'll be talking about today, is not something on which your salvation hinges. It's not something that we would call an essential for our faith. There are people, I said a couple weeks ago, here who will disagree with me on what I'm about to preach, what I'm about to teach. And I was right. There was two people that came to me afterwards last time and very respectfully said, you know, we appreciate what you're saying, but we are among those who disagree with you. But they did it in a great way, very respectfully. Uh, one of them said, you know, you as a Presbyterian minister preaching in a Presbyterian pulpit would be remiss if you didn't speak about this topic from time to time. One said, I, I fully anticipated to hear it and I appreciate the way that you approached it and brought it to us. So the question then comes, if it's not essential and if people disagree with one another, Christians, Bible-believing Christians disagree on their understanding of this idea, why am I preaching on it? The answer to that is very simple. Because it's here. It's in God's Word. And I can have no better reason to preach anything than it's in God's Word. When I became a preacher, I did not become a preacher to tell everybody what they all wanted to hear and make sure that they all were patted on the back I'm not Joel Olstein. I'm not there just to give you a happy message that makes you feel good for the week. I'm here to preach what's written in God's Word. And as we come to chapter 9 in Romans, I believe that this is what's here. And while we don't fully all agree on it, I want to one more time point out that though we disagree, this is not one of those things that one of us is going to end up in heaven and the other is not. This is something we can disagree on and still be happy together celebrating Christ's love for eternity in heaven. So then the question remains, what is it? What's the subject that we're going to be talking about today? Predestination. What is predestination? Predestination is the uh, doctrine that says that God himself chooses who will come to faith in him. God of his own will determines who will believe and who will not. It's a, a doctrine that says God's decision is not based on anything in us, not based on our own inclination to believe, not based on our own desire to believe, not based on our yearning to be close to God, that is based purely and entirely on God's will and God's will alone. It takes the responsibility for salvation and places it squarely in God's hands so that God receives all the credit and all the glory. The, the opposite of that is free will. The idea that we ourselves choose what we believe. We come to faith um, in and of ourselves, and that God supports us in that faith and empowers us to come to a full knowledge of that faith. Free will says that we have an inclination or a desire or maybe a kernel or a seed of faith that God nourishes and waters and grows into a full-fledged faith. Predestination, that's the difference between predestination and free will. But what they have in common is even more important. Both agree that there is only one way to salvation and that is through faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Both agree to that, and both teach that. And that is more important than how you get there, and that's the distinction. Predestination says that God initiates, and we respond. Free will says that we initiate, and God responds. So I said that our passage was uh, talking about predestination, and you may recall two weeks ago, 
uh, three weeks ago, I guess it is now, when we looked at the uh, verses 6 through 13, Paul is bringing up Isaac and Ishmael and Esau and Jacob. And we're saying, uh, he's saying there that God chose Isaac and not Ishmael. And God chose Jacob and not Esau. And this was a picture of his sovereign choice for salvation. Now, some people say, no, 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 that was a choice, but it wasn't for salvation. And they will say, that was a choice for God's redemptive plan. God was choosing through whom to reveal his redemption. He chose Isaac and not Ishmael. He chose Esau and not Jacob. But the question of what is God, what is Paul talking about here can be very easily ascertained when you open up chapter 9 and look at what Paul is talking about. Paul is weeping and he's crying and he's, he's anguished over the lack of salvation he's seeing in his people. He's saying, I am crying because my people are not accepting Jesus Christ. They are being damned and going to hell. And he says, this breaks my heart. And he says, I would even almost wish that we could trade places. I want them to be saved so much. And so at the very beginning of chapter 9, he orients us to what is his subject, and that is salvation, faith, and belief. And then when we come to verses 6 and following, when he starts talking about Ishmael and Isaac and Esau and Jacob, it's not so much that he's talking about the uh, plan of redemption, but actually those who have received redemption. Some people say, no, he's talking about a nation, a group of people. But in every case, he's talking about individuals. Isaac is an individual. Ishmael is an individual. Esau is an individual. Jacob is an individual. And then he goes on and he says, not all of Israel is Israel. He's saying not all of the descendants of Israel are believers. Again, he's talking about salvation here of individuals, of people. And so throughout the first two sections of chapter 9, Paul is again and again coming back to this idea of salvation. Who is saved and who is lost? And he's referring it back to God's sovereign choice of predestination that God chooses people. Now when you talk to people about this today, one or two things always come up. One or two objections seem to bubble to the surface inevitably. What is the objection to the idea that God chooses who to save and chooses to relieve, to, to allow other people to suffer punishment? What's the objection? It's not fair, right? It's not fair. It's unjust. How could God do that? How could a loving God choose some people and reject others based purely on nothing that no merit in them whatsoever? This is, this is a big problem. And you know, it's not a new idea. If Paul was really talking about predestination back in his day and saying this is how people are saved, the people back then were, were no dummies. They would have understood and they would have had some of the same objections that we have today. And they would be saying things like, but Paul, that's not fair. How can that be fair? How can God be just? And if Paul, who had spoken with these people on numerous occasions, was, understood this, we might be able to find somewhere in his writing a, an address of that objection. Paul might somewhere address that. When we come to our verse today, lo and behold, what does he say? What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? This is the exact problem that Paul is now addressing. He's saying, I know that when you hear me say this, you will think that, I am, that God is unjust, that God is not fair, that God is unrighteous. That God, how could God choose this way? So he addresses this very question. You know, if, if Paul was saying, as some people argue, that God's not talking and choosing individuals for salvation, but he's choosing a group of people through whom to reveal his redemptive plan. He's choosing a nation to serve him. There'd be no allegations of injustice, would there? God can choose whoever he wants to work through to bring about his redemptive plan for all people. That's not unjust, so there'd be no objection, no cry of foul, no, no cry of injustice. And if Paul is just talking about 
uh, groups of people, not individuals, nations working for God, or even more specifically, people serving God, says, I choose you because you have musical skill to be a musician, and I choose you as a carpenter to, to build uh, beautiful implements for the house of God, and I choose you to uh, who have uh, excellent skills in baking to, to be a baker and to, to serve um, uh, people in need. You say, well, that's not unjust. Nobody would object to that. If Paul was talking about these sorts of things, nobody would object. Nobody would say, that's unjust. But Paul knows that that's not what he's talking about. And when he says, people will say that I'm unjust, by saying that people will say that God is unjust, he's addressing the concerns that people will have when he brings up the idea of predestination. What shall we say then? Verse 14. Is there injustice on God's part? And he answers, by no means. And this is that very, very strong Greek um, negation. He says, by no means. I think we translated it best when we said, no way, Jose. Right? Do you remember? Absolutely not. God forbid. In no way. Don't even think about it. This is absolutely not true. And people will say this. People will say that God's unjust when they hear this idea that he's the one that chooses. And then he goes on and he chooses, he says, let me prove it to you. Let me prove to you that predestination does not cause God to be unjust. It is not evidence that God is unjust. Now, for us, when somebody says, let me prove it to you, what we want is a well-reasoned, well-thought-out explanation. We want a logical flow of thought. If A, then B, then C, then D. But that's not what Paul does here. Paul says, let me prove it to you. And what does he do? He quotes two passages of Scripture, both from Exodus. Why? Because predestination is something we will struggle with. With our logic, it doesn't make sense. How can God be just and fair if he chooses people based entirely on his own will? That doesn't make sense. And Paul doesn't try to explain it logically. He says, let me prove it to you. And then he quotes two passages from Exodus, the first one from Exodus 33. He says, is God therefore unjust? No, by no means, absolutely not. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, verse 16, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. You have to understand what's going on in Moses' life at this point. Exodus 32, Moses was up on the mountain talking to God. God was giving him the Ten Commandments. The people were down at the foot of the mountain. Do you remember what they did? They made a golden calf. They began to idol worship, idolatry. Just in like 40 days, they turned away from the God who had just brought them out of Egypt to worship a metal cow. And God was livid. And he said to Moses, I'm going to destroy this people because they are so stiff-necked, and I'm going to wipe them off the face of the planet, and I'm going to start a new people with you. Instead of Israel, from now on, we're going to call them Moses, the people of Moses. Instead of the people of Israel, Jacob's descendants, they will now be Moses' descendants. And Moses pled and begged on their behalf, and God relented, and God said, I will spare them. But when he got down off the mountain, and he spoke to the people, in chapter 32, he criticized them and chastised them for their ignorance and their lack of faith and their lack of consistency with God. And ultimately, God killed 3,000 people. And in that context, Moses says, what's going on here, God? And God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will decide. I am God. I make that choice, who receives mercy and who doesn't. Well, Moses gets very nervous about this. He says, well, what about me then, God? What, what guarantee do I have? I'm a sinner, just like these people. Maybe I didn't do that, but I did lots of other things. What assurance do I have that tomorrow you won't turn around and choose to show wrath and justice on me? He says, can you give me any assurance, God? Because if not, we shouldn't go any further. Because we just, we can't live all of our lives in fear. And God says, I will give you an assurance. And that's where he puts Moses in the cleft of the rock. Do you remember this? 
He puts Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he passes by, and he lets Moses see his afterglory, and then he says these words again, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion, and I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And in a sense, he's saying to Moses, I have chosen to show you compassion and mercy. But on 3,000 Israelites, he chose to show justice. The next passage that Paul quotes in verse 17 is also from Acts, it's a little earlier, in, excuse me, also from Exodus, it's a little earlier in Exodus, it's chapter 9, verse 17 here he says, in chapter 9 of um, Romans, Paul quotes chapter 9 of Exodus, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So here we have another comparison that Paul is using. He's talking about Pharaoh and Moses. In the first place, we were talking about the Israelites, those who uh, worship the calf. Some of them God had mercy on, and some of them he condemned and showed his justice to. Now he's talking another example. He says Pharaoh and Moses. On Moses, he is having compassion. On Pharaoh, he's going to show his justice. In fact, more than that, he says, this is the reason that I raised you up, Pharaoh. God speaking to Pharaoh through Moses in Exodus says, I raised you up so that my power and my might might be exhibited to all. Do you remember what happened with Pharaoh and Moses, that God's power was exhibited? Do you remember 10 plagues at the command of Moses' hand? Do you remember a pillar of fire guiding the Israelites through the wilderness? and defending them from an army of Egyptians? Do you remember when the Red Sea did something it never did before and will never do again, parted so that people could walk through on dry ground? Do you remember that the Israelites went down into the Red Sea and they came up on the far side and the Egyptians went down and got stuck and the wind stopped blowing and the sea collapsed in on them? God definitely used Pharaoh to display his power and his might and his justice because every one of those 10 plagues was a judgment on idolatry in Exodus. God says that he raised Pharaoh up for that purpose. That's hard for us to think about. God made Pharaoh. God brought him to power. God made him become the next Pharaoh so that he could do these things and show them to all the people. And we think, ow, oh, why? A loving God, how could a loving God do these things? But we forget that God chooses when to show his power and when to reveal his mercy. Both Moses and Pharaoh saw the wondrous deeds of God, did they not? They both saw all these amazing and incredible things. And what was Moses' response? He worshiped God. We have a song written in Exodus by Moses declaring God's goodness and his wonder and his power. And what did Pharaoh do? Do you remember what Pharaoh did? He rallied the troops and tried to slaughter the Israelites. He defied God. And every time there was a new plague, he said, nope, not going to let you go. Okay, now let you go. Nope, not going to let you go. Now let you go. Nope, not going to let you go. He kept on antagonizing God and not believing, no matter how bad the plagues got. Even after the 10th plague, when his own son died, he said, get out. And then after they got out, he said, what have I done? Nope, i got to go get them. So time after time after time, God hardened Pharaoh's heart and allowed Pharaoh to harden his own heart so that God's justice would be evident to all peoples. And it was evident. Do you remember what Rahab the prostitute said when Joshua arrived, um, the, the spies arrived at Jericho? She said, we all know what your God has done. We are all very familiar with your God. We know the power of your God. God was glorified by his justice displayed in Exodus and in Egypt. Today, we don't understand what good is. A lot of people in our culture, in America today, think that something is good if it makes me happy. In fact, there's songs written like that, right? If it makes you happy, you can probably sing a couple of them. Do it if it makes you feel good. Do that which you want to, follow your heart. Hallmark specials, right? But that's not what good is. 
The Bible doesn't ever describe that that which makes you happy is, is good. It says that which glorifies God is good. We get all mixed up and we think oh, somebody is sad, therefore God is failing. We think somebody is suffering, therefore God has lost or God is ignorant or God doesn't care. God cares, but the highest good in all the universe is to glorify God. The Westminster Confession, the Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? What is the highest, noblest purpose of the human beings? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The highest good that can happen in this life is God to be glorified. So if that means, if God is glorified by my suffering, then that's good. That's the highest good. If God is glorified by your poverty, then that's good. If God is glorified by your illness, then that's good. If God is glorified by your death, or my death, or the death of someone we love very dearly, we say, how can that be good? But if God is glorified, that is good. And that's a hard thing for us to accept because it hurts. But here's what Paul's talking about. Think about the mothers in Egypt whose sons died. Do you think they thought that was good? Their eldest son died? Absolutely not. But God was glorified. Think about the family of the soldiers who were pursuing the Israelites down into the Red Sea. Did their families think that that was good? That the sea collapsed in on them and they all drowned? Absolutely not. <coughs> but was God glorified? <coughs> Beyond belief, because here we are, 3,000 years later, still talking about it, about the power and might and majesty of God. It's hard. It is not an easy thing. And that's what Paul is wrestling with here along with us. He's saying, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? No, absolutely not. For look at these things. In the past, God has always chosen. He has chosen to save some, and he has chosen to allow some to suffer the full consequences of their sin and the punishment. And God still works that same way today. That's what Paul is talking about. He's, uh, he's dealing with the objections to this, the, the things that we struggle with, the things we say, how can that be? That's exactly what Paul is dealing with because he knows that that's what we're struggling with. And next week, we're going to pick up on another one of these, how can it be, questions about predestination. How can God actually do that? How can God work in this way and still be God? And we will wrestle with that passage together next week. But just know, God has the power, if you say that God is sovereign, that he has all power, that he is almighty, that he can do anything, that it is within God's power and his prerogative to choose salvation for some and not for others. And if you say, like some people I've heard say, well, I'm not going to worship a God like that, then you're choosing not to worship God. If you say, I'm only going to worship God if he acts in this way. And I don't care what you fill in the blank. As you read through scriptures, struggle with scriptures and say, God, I don't understand this. But I will worship you nonetheless. Because you are God and you know better than I do. And I have some ideas about why God works this way. We don't have time to get into those. But um, if you'd like to talk more about it, I'm happy to do that. We won't be probably getting into it next week either. But um, God reveals himself for who he is. And it is our job to accept that or to reject that. Not to change him. For the moment we change him, we have made a metal calf that isn't the true God. So let me end here by just reminding you, I know that some of you will say, but Daniel, Daniel, I know that this is Romans 9, but back here in Joshua 24, or over here in and you'll have different passages you're going to say, but what about these passages? And we'll talk about those. And I want to thank you, those of you who disagree with me that are here today, who are sitting there just gritting your teeth and saying, oh, I want to shout out. I want to thank you for not shouting out. And I want to commit to you that if you want to tell me 
uh, your perspective on why free will is in the Bible or if, if refute Romans 9, I will be happy to sit and I will do exactly what you did. I will listen to you and I will let you unfold your understanding and I will not speak out or object. I will respect you in the same way that you have respected the pulpit today in keeping uh, your composure and prayerfully um, trusting that I haven't caused too many people to uh, uh, waver in their faith because this is a tough issue. When I was um, uh, candidate to be the pastor here 14, almost 14 years ago now, they asked me a question. They said, is there anything that you don't want to preach on? Is there anything that you're afraid to preach on? Is there anything you definitely would want to avoid? And I said, if it's in the Bible, I'll preach on it. Because that's my call. But I said, there are certain subjects that are going to be harder than others. Divorce is one of them because we've all been touched by that. But predestination is another one. And I have to tell you, this is not a passage that I look forward to preaching. Because I know that it's going to cause some tension in people's relationship, maybe with me or with each other. As they say, well, I'm on this side, well, I'm on this side. But let me conclude by saying, this is not an essential to your salvation. If you disagree with me and you walk out of here today and say, Daniel, you are so far off base. You're a lunatic. But you come back next Sunday to worship. Thank you for coming back. We'll still be in heaven together because we both agree that maybe we don't know how we get to faith. Maybe we disagree on how we get to faith, but faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior is that key that we both agree is necessary. That is the essential. This is important because it affects all sorts of other things about how we view God. So that's why we're preaching on it, because it's here, because it's important. But feel free to get online, to go home and research it, and call me and say, all right, I'm ready, and I'll be happy to meet with you and pray with you. In the meantime, let's pray together and give God the glory that he deserves. Father.